Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Horror Analysis with me, Drew. Hi there. <laughs> we are talking about the horror tale today. Continuing with this, we're on Stephen King's version, which Tales of the Hook and Tales of the Tarot. We are done with Tales of the Hook. We're going, continuing on with Tales of the Tarot. And Cobb. Stephen. Um... And of course, Tales of the Tarot are certain involve certain archetypes, tropes, or conventions in which the stories will conform to an extent. There's going to be similarities with all Tales of the Tarot, um, whichever tarot card we're in. The thing without a name last time, this time is the vampire. There's going to be certain similarities between them. There's cor correlations. The cards are, the thing without a name is the first card, the second card is the vampire, the third card is the werewolf, and the fourth or the fourth and a half card is the ghost or the bad place. Um, it's a vaporous idea and we're going to discuss that later. Um, the second tarot card is the vampire, typified by Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, I have this version. I recommend this version because it has a neat little intro by Stephen King, which I recommend also. It includes Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and the werewolf card, which is, of course, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Stevenson. Um, I picked it up for 99 cents at Goodwill. Um, it's only seven ninety five if you buy it new. And I wouldn't have a problem with that. You could probably pick it up online for even less than seven ninety five. Maybe not less than a buck. This is why I paid. But I got lucky. Um of course I think all three of those books are also available on Librivox dot org. Um L I B R I V O X dot org. Um it's a great um public domain audiobooks. Since they're public domain books, they don't have a copyright on them. Amateur readers read audiobooks, and some of the readers are very good. And I'm sure you can find all three of these books on LibriVox. You won't have the Stephen King introductory thing, but it's still... You know, it's nice to... If you don't want to read Frankenstein, which I don't blame you, because it's a tough read, um, you can listen to it. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and Dracula, I recommend reading, actually, with book form, but you don't have to. Or you could read along in the book while listening to the audiobook. Ooh, I have my hot water today. It is very hot still, and I don't know how much I'll be drinking of that. So, we are on Dracula. I'm going to give a quick synopsis of Dracula, because that's what King does, and it does illustrate the point, since... Lots of people haven't read Dracula. Um, they've probably seen a movie or two, but a movie or two changed certain things. Dracula starts with Jonathan Harker, um, who's an attorney or a you know learning uh, an apprentice attorney, um, is going to Transylvania to sell a house, to do paperwork to sell a house to Count Dracula of a London house, Carfax Abbey. Um, He is imprisoned by Dracula after a fashion, um, attacked by three female vampires, the weird, uh, several female vampires, I'm not sure how many, how many there are. It's three in the movies. I'm getting mixed up myself a little. Um, <laughs> referred to as the Weird Sisters, uh, by King at least, if not by Stoker himself. Um, and escapes, but by that time... Dracula is gone on to London. The boat he's sailing on, no one survives, except for Dracula, and he's not dead to begin with, being a vampire. Um, spoiler alert, <laughs> Dracula's a vampire. Who would have guessed? Um, so the captain's the only one that wasn't drained um, or pushed overboard. 
he chains himself to the steering wheel and uh, ship's wheel rather and with his cross and freezes to death or at least dies of dehydration um, it's dehydration I think in the book um, a spectral dog jumps off the boat when it goes when it runs ashore in England um, and that is where Dra is Dracula attacking uh, will attack Lucy Westenra. Um, Lucy Westenra is the best friend of Mina Harker, Jonathan's wife. So it's sort of, you know, odd occurrence, but it moves the plot along. <laughs> um, and uh, Lucy is being courted by three guys. Quincy Morris, the American with the awful Texas accent. Um, Dr. Seward, the sanitarium owner or runner, um, manager, I guess. Owner as well, but the person who runs it. Um, and the rich boy who actually ends up being betrothed to her, Arthur Homewood. Um, Lucy, however, is being drained by the vampire Dracula. is in fact um, seemingly having an affair with Dracula uh, under his thrall, in his thrall. So he, she is mysteriously taken ill. Um, in the course of trying to treat her, they bring in Dr. Abraham Van Helsing um, to help, and he figures out the we're talk, dealing with Dracula. Um, or we're dealing with vampire. And then they deduce it's va uh, Dracula from that. Especially when Harker gets back. Pardon. Yes. So Lucy is in fact killed and turned into a vampire herself. And starts attacking young kids um, in London as the bloofer lady being the cockney little brat version of one of his uh, of beautiful because Lucy is beautiful um, but the cockney kid who is almost a victim calls it bloofer which I think references back to our mutual friend which is the Dickens book or vice versa I'm not sure I think mutual friend came first sorry that's nothing really that didn't have anything to do with anything um, Arthur Holmwood and Van Helsing track Lucy down put a stake through her heart chop her head off and stuff her head with garlic um, meanwhile Mina I'll go back to the point I was thinking about in a minute meanwhile Mina is the next victim, apparent victim of Dracula. Um, she is moved to the sanitarium of Dr. Seward to protect her while the fearless vampire hunters, Harker, the three suitors, and Van Helsing start destroying the mounds of earth, the coffins full of earth that Dracula's brought along with him. Um, but he's flown the coop yet again. Um, so while the vampire hunters are attacking loads of dirt. Dracula breaks into the sanitarium through convincing Renfield, who is the um, fly-eating, insect-eating, spider-eating, followed by bird-eating um, madman to let him in, to invite him in. And he does that by promising him lots and lots of rats, and who can say no to lots and lots of rats? In in any in his position, who wouldn't say no to lots and lots of rats? Um, but he, he changes his mind and gets killed by Dracula as well, because he tries to he realizes what a jackass he's been um, at the last minute, and dies. But it's too late. Dracula's already in the sanitarium. He gets out. He 
um, goes after Mina, gives Mina blood from his breast in a very creepy scene, um, and Mina is infected. She no longer can touch the host, um, the communion wafer. And for those of us non-Catholics of us, um, interestingly, it's not the cross so much, except for the possibly the ship's captain that um, dies from exposure um, and lack of water, etc., dehydration, etc. Um, exposure, I think, is probably the best term for it. Even though I'm changing my mind four times on that one, um, f most of what Van Helsing uses to keep the vampire at bay is the communion wafer, the host. Um, also, interestingly, it's garlic blossoms, not garlic cloves, that are repellent to the vampire in Dracula the Book, which I find very interesting and is never portrayed in the movie, and I think it should be. Um, however, so this is where the story really ramps up towards the end. Um, once Mina is infected, they all travel, and we know that Dracula's flown the coop again back to Transylvania. They all go to Transylvania to track him down on his home turf. Um, they do so. Quincy Morris doesn't make it out. So that's what you get for having a bad Texas accent in a <laughs> British book. Um, Mina is... Mina and Dr. Van Helsing kill the weird sisters um, and the the boys stab Dracula to death with knives, which is a takeoff of more than likely a reference to Jack the Ripper because he's ripped apart with knives. Um, yes. Not steak. He was not staked. Um... And of course, he was wandering around in midday, but that's you know the myth. The myths fall apart on Dracula, but it's okay because it's Dracula. It's where the myths um, not come from, because they, there's plenty of other primal, uh, more earlier vampire stories that influenced Bram Stoker, and we're going to talk about them in the history portion that I'm still researching, which is going to take a while because. It's tough. As it stands now with that, I'm going backwards. I did finish the Tales of the Tarot. And I'm going backwards, because now I have a new headpiece, as you can see. Um, and I'm going backwards and doing the earlier videos in a way that can be heard, because my laptop's microphone is awful. So that's the synopsis of Dracula. Dracula has two things. The, vamp uh, the vampire story quintessentially Dracula quintessentially the vamp the quintessential vampire story has two things about it. It is the story of outside evil and it is the primal rape story. Rape, you say? Yeah, that's the R word, folks. Um Yeah, we're gonna skip rape for the time being. Um it's forced sex rather than Um, I don't think... Rape is probably the right technical word for it. It doesn't feel right in our mouths and in our hearts. In our heads, even. It gives me a headache even to say the word that many times. Um, as many times as I'm going to say it in this video. Let's get start with outside evil. It's much easier to understand. Um, most... Almost all stories of outside evil are in some way, shape, or form vampire stories. It is good things happening to bad people for no reason whatsoever. Bad things are out there and they can get you for no reason at all. Um, in Dracula, Harker is entrapped by Dracula um, in Transylvania. And he simply went there because his boss asked him to go. He didn't deserve to be trapped in any way, shape, or form. He's a good guy from page one to page end. <laughs> 
there is there's nothing in Harker that is evil in any way. He's a good guy. He's a neutral guy, but he's a good guy. He's not saintly. Um, Lucy's death wasn't any moral retribution. Sure, she was sort of dating three guys at once, but they all knew about it, and they're all friends with each other, which is kind of weird. But there's nothing really amor uh, immoral about Lucy at all. She certainly didn't deserve to be turned into a vampire, um, become a quasi-pedophile, and then have her head chopped off, a stake driven through her heart, and her corpse stuffed with garlic. That's a bit extreme for the sins that Lucy has exhibited in the book, which are basically none. The only accountability can fall on Renfield, who did let Dracula into the madhouse, into the sanitarium, but he's insane. He's not really accountable for his actions. Um, non, non compos mentis. Um, hey, I got a big word in there. Um, he's not responsible because he isn't madman. Um, and he's not a big enough character to take responsibility for everything that happened in the book. That's ridiculous. Um, he's a side character only. Um, so, outside evil. Um, oh, we're going to talk about Lovecraft some more. That's more outside evil. But we're going to talk about that in the rape bit. Um, so, primal rape. This we have to back up into... Stephen King. Does a very good job of explaining it. Um, in Victorian-era London, when the story takes place, and when the story was written there was not a whole lot of sexy stuff going on. It was uh, not a lot of miniskirts and decolletage. It was puritanical, to say the least. Um, bustles and stuff. Not, not that sexy. Um, however, there was interest, as there is in any society. The more repressive the, the more repressive the society, the, the kinkier things can get. Um, there is no missionary position going on in Dracula, um, as King so rightly says it. Most of it is a code for lack of better term, for oral sex. Um, Dracula takes fluid from uh, the women. He only preys on women. He takes fluid from the women instead of in normal sex, the male puts fluid into the woman. Um, In intercourse, I guess, would be the proper term. The weird sisters in attacking Jonathan Harker... Oh, it's better just to point out what what King has, because King points it out. He does some... Not selective editing. He just takes the most telling paragraph. Um, the girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There's a delip, deliberate voluptuousness... Which, both, which was both thrilling and repulsive, and she arched her neck and actually licked her lips. This is page 82 on um, dance. Um, he saw the moisture on her lips, the tongue going across her teeth. She, he heard the tongue churning in her mouth, etc., etc., and then the count comes in and breaks up the party, and he and all the he is kind of disappointed as well as all the readers are disappointed because they wanted to know what was going to happen. Um, that's fellatio, um, as King 
has a quips is King Quips, the uh, kind of girl who went down on your knees was not the kind of girl who you took home to mother um, in Victorian London. There's uh, going on at the time, of course, Jack the Ripper was going on, as I mentioned before. Um, and of course, so prostitution was around, obviously, and sort of high profile since a lot of prostitutes are being killed. Um, there's a mesmerism fa craze going on at that point. Uh, Franz Mesmer was the father of hypnotism. And so you'll see in lots of Dracula portrayals, there's a hypnosis element to Dracula. It's the, you're under my spell thing. And then Dracula gets to tell them to do whatever they want. Um, also in King, King points out that Mesmer and his followers uh, put people into trances by stroking them all over their body. Mesmer and his followers mostly preferred young single ladies. Um, and some of the side effects were... I'm just going to get the quote. It's so fantastic. <laughs> um, let's see here. 80... what did I say? 89? 85? Ah, 83. Um, wonderful feelings that seem to culminate in bursts of pleasure. Which we would think of as an orgasm, but as King points out, quote, uh, single ladies in Victorian London wouldn't know a orgasm if it bit them on the nose. Actually, that's a paraphrase, not a pure quote, but whatever. Um, so there is sexual tension in the vampire's uh, myth. Be because of the prudishness of the society. The rape comes about because it's not the character's fault. Jonathan Harker, when the girl is on her knees in front of him, probably wanted that to continue when the Count breaks it up. But hey, it's not his fault. He he is innocent in this because, um, and of course, all the readers living vicariously through Jonathan Harker at that point are innocent of any wrongdoing in that, because they it's the outside evil that is attacking them. The women who are preyed upon by Dracula get the pleasurable burst of feeling from that is taken from mesmerism um, and they are enthralled in enthrall and enthralled um, by him so the sexual element I would say is sort of central to the vampire theme as all as well. King, in his book, jettisons it um, in Salem's Lot, which is his take on the vampire tale. Um, I'm going to jump back to Lovecraft real quick. Lovecraft is, of course, outside of evil. Um, King makes a point of saying that there's something vaginal in the conceptions of Lovecraftian monsters. Um... I'm not going to go into too many details, but there's similarities between what a what a Puritan himself, Lovecraft, who was definitely sexist if you read any of his books, as well as racist if you read any of his books, and we're going to go into that when we talk about supernatural um, horror and literature. There's some racism and sexism that you have to wade through, and you just have to deal with it. Unfortunately, 
product of his time and generation and place. Um, he was from uh, Rhode Island in Pur Puritan form. And he was kind of scared of the opposite sex. And I don't know what happened in his life to equate vag <laughs> vaginas with scary things, but there is something vaginal about his creations. And further on, uh, going a step further, the concept of tentacle rape in Lovecraftian, neo-Lovecraftian movies or anime, Japanese anime, there's a lot of Lovecraftian themes in those kind of movies. It's tentacle rape, though, and that's... There's sexual element in these kind of outside evil stories. Stephen King wrote Salem's Lot, and he jettisoned the sex out of it. Um, and I don't think Salem Lot, Salem's Lot works. I don't think Stephen King is very good at vampire stories, and I don't think Stephen King's very good at werewolf stories. Um, I don't like. I wasn't scared of from Cycle of the Werewolf, and I wasn't scared from Sal Salem's Lot either, except for Hubie Marston, because Stephen King is exceptional at ghosts. Uh, Stephen King's ghosts scare me, oh, a hundred percent of the time. Um, Hubie Marston, terrifying. That's what scared me in Salem's Lot. That's what kept me up for you know two or three nights. The vampires, not so much. There's some tension there, but not fright. Um, not terror. Um, some of it was horror, the falling into the pit of knives, um, but not from the vampire so much. Be that as it may. Um, and of course, we're going to talk more about werewolves tomorrow. Um, Cycle of the Werewolf also did not hit the right notes uh, for the werewolf tale. Um, even in King's terms, when King's terms for Werewolf and that, which we'll go into the to next time as well. Um, so he had Stephen King in Salem's Lot was purely focused on outside evil. Um, no one deserved what they got, maybe with the exception of the jerk bus driver who was killed by the kids that he terrorized. Um, once they turned into vampires. But no one really deserved any of what they got in Salem's Lot or in any real true vampire tale. Um, but for there is a sexual element and I think King suffered by taking the sexual element out. Um, he did it because in the late 70s when he wrote it there was lots of talk about sex there was, you know, he even said, hey, there's the world, this world, unlike the 1890s, 1900s of Bram Stoker, has the penthouse forum, has, you know, classes about sex, uh, workshops, and blah, blah, blah. And so he has a point, you know, where do you push the envelope? Except you can push the envelope. It's been done since Stephen King, so it's certainly could have been done by Stephen King. Um, a little bit before Stephen King, one that did push the envelope was Interview with a Vampire, which is a vampire tale. Not necessarily terrifying, but certainly a tale of outside evil-ish. They're more characters, so they become less evil. They become anti-heroes, I guess, more than um, villains. But there's primal rape. Um, this is from the movie Interview with the Vampire, and that is Tom Cruise biting the neck of Brad Pitt, who, from the look on his face, doesn't seem to mind. Um, or, if you prefer, that is Tom Cruise's lips on the neck of Brad Pitt. Um, in the 90s, when the film was being made, it was still kind of risque thing to show. Brad Pitt doesn't look like he minds there. In the book, um, 
the character does not mind at all either. Um, the character, the sorry, the book was written in 1976 with earlier drafts going back to 1968-69. Um, I wikipedia this before I decided today. So, um, in 76, there was start of the LGBT revolution. Um, maybe a bit before 76, but in the 70s there was the beginning of the LGBT revolution um, becoming, trying to get non-heterosexual lifestyles become more acceptable. A lot of people reading Interview with a Vampire, and by reading of course I mean living vicariously through the characters, would be thrilled by this sort of thing happening. It was an outlet, a sexual outlet, for closeted, in many cases, homosexuals during that time, um, and as well as in the 90s for closeted homosexuals where there's a revamping um, post-80s um, Christian coalition type stuff. The 90s bringing back into the gaining traction of the gay rights movement. Um, there's more. Also in the 90s is the invention of the push-up bra, which was demonized and undemonized, <laughs> depending on your per, um, position on the matter. But there's Dracula dead and loving it. And there we go. Look at those beauties. Um, this is Lucy Weston Ra's... Oh, no, it was... Oh, it was different. They changed the name in her. I think it was Lucy Seward, actually. No, it was Lucy Weston Ross still. It's Mina Seward. They changed the characters around in, in the book a bit. Um, but Lucy was turned into a vampire, and then the side effect of being turned into a vampire would be voluptuous bosom. Um... not necessarily something that is in the nine, early 90s was shown all that often and certainly frowned upon when shown um, you are seen as a certain type of woman if you show, uh, showed up with a push-up bra but push-up bras did sell very well and they became popular not as a result of that of course but it did reflect it and of course this is a comedy version of the Dracula th story so there's only a little bit a little bit can be taken with a grain of salt there. Further on, early 2000s, um, this is from Van Helsing. Sorry, blanked there for a moment. This is your classic threesome, if you want to see it that way. Dracula and his two brides, or two of his brides, um, in the classic threesome. Also, a risque thing. Um, let's see, I actually have some some uh, vampire tales here. In This is a book of short stories by Connie Willis. I recommend Connie Willis to all sci-fi fans and fantasy fans. She's fantastic just in general. Um, she has a story called Jack, which is an exact um, it's a mirror of Dracula. Um, Jack is the vampire. Drac, Jack, get it? Um, and Jack is also the hero, the fearless vampire hunter. Um, they have the same name, but it's Jonathan Harker is the character. There is a Mina, and there is a Lucy, and it takes place in the London Blitz. Um, the characters, main group of characters, are digging people out of bombed out houses. Jack the vampire can smell a living heart, a beating heart, you know, under rubble. So he's actually helping to dig people out and occasionally digs people out. But if it's a young woman or a girl, which gets creepier because we do have the idea in our, our head now that it's primal rape, um, 
and one of the girls was called Mina, and one of the girls was called Lucy, I think? Maybe it's been a while since I've read it. I know one of them was called Mina, and she dies, um, because she's drained by the vampire. Um, and of course, things go on. Um, the fearless vampire hunter, Jack, comes back from the war ready to fight Jack, the bad vampire. Um, and finds out that Jack the Vampire got a stake to his heart with a beam came down on him when he was trying to save somebody's life. And the thing was about that one was Jack was actually trying to help the cause even though he was also trying to feed. Um, a sort of sexy book. It's sort of tame as far as the um, sex angle goes as far as kinky sex angle goes, but it is sort of sexy. Essie Hinton's The Hawk, Hawk's Harbor. Um, it's Essie Hinton, so she's kind of tameish anyway. She did the she's most famous for The Outsiders. Um, but there is the the vampire's buddy vampire's helper the Renfield from other movies where Renfield is actual Dracula's helper um, in general is in a really has a lot of kinky has a lot of kinky sex and a lot of stuff's going on it's kind of dreamy it's kind of a lot of dream stuff in that it's a good book I recommend both of those of course um the one I probably recommend most is Somtau's versions of the vampire myth. Um, Valentine, Thanatos, and the first one, which I can't find, is Vampire Junction. It's a... This was written in the 80s, so it's a little bit 80s-ish. It is... a very... is probably the best... Um, vampire book that's been read, written in a while. Um, Somtau's classic monsters are everything that King's classic monsters aren't. Um, I did mention last time Chuchai um, is one of, from his vamp, uh, from the Frankenstein book. Um, he did write a great little Frankenstein story. Um, in this and then, and tomorrow I'm mention we'll mention uh, Moon Dance, which is one of the greatest werewolf books from the 80s and 90s. I'm not sure which one it, when it was published. Um, <laughs> okay, so Vampire Junction is about Timmy Valentine. Um, Timmy Valentine, is it? Yep, Timmy Valentine, who is a pop star, uh, a bubblegum pop star, even, like a, a little boy, who has the voice of an angel, and he's a... sings these really dark songs. Problem is, he's a vampire, and he's been a vampire since Vesuvius erupted. Um, Vesuvius? Yes, Vesuvius. Um, in B.C. whatever. Um, he was turned into a vampire by the Oracle of Delphi, or something like that. It's a little bit weird. Um, and the story does have some bad points, like he keeps meeting famous people throughout his life, like um, Caravaggio, which is not so weird, but he also meets um, Bluebeard. Bluebeard in the first book, anyway. Um... I don't like that if you're going to live for a thousand years, nine times out of, t you know, you're not really going to meet famous people. Um, Two thousand years, my apologies. Um, so in the 80s, he becomes a famous pop star. And he buys a town because he's that rich. And the town becomes a vampire haven 
and bad stuff starts happening in the town other stuff goes down but there is sexual elements there especially with the Bluebeard and especially Caravaggio being that they're pedophiles into boys um, there is stuff going on there and oh and he's a castrato he, that's why he sings so well or that's he sings so well because he's castrato he sings so high pitched because he's castrato um, castrated boy because who are castrated to sing well um, from the 15th century is when most of the castrados happened I might be wrong around there uh, but he was castrated very early on um, anyway and there's weird sex stuff between him and Bluebeard and him and Caravaggio in the second book um, it, these are difficult books to read they're exceptional um, but they usually have to read them and then put them down for a week and pick them back up and then read them for a bit longer and put them down for another week and put them back. There's sex stuff in there and it's kind of weird. It's definitely kinky and it's kind of disturbing to me and it's outside evil to me. Um, quite often the, the vampire is portrayed as the victim because quite often he is. Um, but he's also to blame for a lot of stuff yeah um, they're weird books they're very good books they are very heavy books there's a lot of um, psychology and stuff in them but I do recommend them I recommend them very very highly um, as well as Moon Dance as well um, and the S.E. Hinton as well, and anything by Connie Willis. Jack is in Impossible Things by Connie Willis, um, as well as a lot of other good stories like At the Rialto. Um, what do we have here? Spice Pogrom. Even the Queen. There's there's lots of things. She's a very interesting writer. She's a very some can be a very disturbing writer too. Um, one of the most few of the most disturbing book uh, stories I've read by her. Um, All my darling daughters is just creepy, bad, creepy. It's sci-fi, and there's a, some more sci-fi stuff by her. Um, great time travel books, very Heinlein-esque. And a lot of other good stuff. I just can't recommend her enough if you're a sci-fi or fantasy fan. Um, however, back to King. Back to Dance Macabre. The big point he's trying... Another big point he's trying to make is he points out there's a thing from the 50s, which was another breaking out of social mores and um, allowing some sex to be hinted at in movies. Um... There's the classic movie poster of the girl being carried in the arms of the monster with various clothing barely covering her. I did pick some of these up. The Bride of the Monster. There's the three ro mon robot monster in 3D. Creature of the Black Lagoon has the classic Invasion of the Saucerman. October the Great. Buxom women, scantily clad, in the arms of the monster. Primal rape. Um, they're swooning, if you like. Um, I have an issue with rape being the right word, but it is sex where you are not to blame and you didn't ask for. So that's rape. Um, it is the, not the rape that we find acceptable because fairly often the 
it's implied that they enjoy it, which is not acceptable in society as we talk about rape in our society. Um, it's more along the lines of what it should be called is primal, the safe word is banana um, thing, where it's play rape. Um, safe word stuff. Edge play, I think is the technical term for that kind of behavior. Um, so vampire stories do have sexual element in them. They're typified by um, they're exemplified by outside evil. If you have those two elements, no matter what the actual monster is, it's a vampire card. It's a vampire tarot. Um, just as with creature without a name, if you have the elements there, it's a creature without a name is and werewolf. You know, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde is a werewolf tale. He's not turning into a werewolf, uh, but it's a werewolf tale. There's elements of the werewolf in ghost stories or haunted house stories in that it's a dichotomy. It's a switching. Um, and of course, Norman Bates, our old friend, is a werewolf tale because he switches from Norman to Norma to n normal. Um, it, so the vampire card, that's uh, it is the outside evil when you have that pure outside evil. Of course, tomorrow we're going to be talking about Werewolf card, which is opposite. It's inside evil. Um, as you probably could have guessed, because you have outside underlined on here. <laughs> and then, we're going into the last tarot card, which is weird one at the bottom. The ghost of the bad place. So that's, that will finish up the horror tale. And I'll see you next time on... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Horror Analysis with me, Drew. Hi there. <laughs> we are talking about the horror tale today. Continuing with this, we're on Stephen King's version, which Tales of the Hook and Tales of the Tarot. We are done with Tales of the Hook. We're going, continuing on with Tales of the Tarot. Fans Hob. Stephen. Um... And of course, tales of the tarot are certain involve certain archetypes, tropes, or conventions in which the stories will conform to an extent. There's going to be similarities with all tales of the tarot, um, whichever tarot card we're in. The thing without a name last time. This time is the vampire. There's going to be certain similarities between them. There's cor correlations. The cards are, the thing without a name is the first card, the second card is the vampire, the third card is the werewolf, and the fourth, or the fourth and a half card, is the ghost or the bad place. Um, it's a vaporous idea, and we're going to discuss that later. Um, the second tarot card is the vampire, typified by Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, I have this version. I recommend this version because it has a neat little intro by Stephen King, which I recommend also. It includes Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and the werewolf card, which is, of course, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Stevenson. Um, I picked it up for 99 cents at Goodwill. Um, it's only seven ninety five if you buy it new. And I wouldn't have a problem with that. You could probably pick it up online for even less than seven ninety five. Maybe not less than a buck. This is why I paid. But I got lucky. Um of course I think all three of those books are also available on Librivox dot org. Um I'll So the captain's the only one that wasn't drained. 
um, or pushed overboard, he chains himself to the steering wheel and uh, ship's wheel, rather, and with his cross and freezes to death, or at least dies of dehydration. Um, it's dehydration, I think. In the book, um, a spectral dog jumps off the boat when it goes when it runs ashore in England, um, and that is where Dra as Dracula attacking uh, will attack Lucy Westenraw. Um, Lucy Westenraw is the best friend of Mina Harker, Jonathan's wife. So it's sort of you know odd occurrence, but it moves the plot along. <laughs> um, and uh, Lucy is being courted by three guys. Quincy Morris, the American with the awful Texas accent. Um, Dr. Su Dracula starts with Jonathan Harker, um, who's an attorney or a you know learning uh, an apprentice attorney, um, is going to Transylvania to sell a house, to do paperwork to sell a house to Count Dracula of a London house, Carfax Abbey. Um, he is imprisoned by Dracula after a fashion. Um, attacked by three female vampires, the weird, uh, several female vampires, I'm not sure how many, how many there are. It's three in the movies. I'm getting mixed up myself a little. Um, <laughs> referred to as the Weird Sisters, uh, by King at least, if not by Stoker himself. Um, and escapes, but by that time, Dracula is gone on to London. The boat he's sailing on, no one survives, except for Dracula, and he's not dead to begin with, being a vampire. Um, spoiler alert, <laughs> Dracula's a vampire, who would have guessed? Um, L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Um, it's a great um, public domain audiobooks. Since they're public domain books, they don't have a copyright on them. Amateur readers read audiobooks, and some of the readers are very good. And I'm sure you can find all three of these books on LibriVox. You won't have the Stephen King introductory thing, but it's still... You know, it's nice to... If you don't want to read Frankenstein, which I don't blame you, because it's a tough read, um, you can listen to it. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and Dracula, I recommend reading actually with book form, but you don't have to. Or you could read along in the book while listening to the audiobook. Oh, I have my hot water today. It is very hot still, and I don't know how much I'll be drinking of that. So, we are on Dracula. I'm going to give a quick synopsis of Dracula, because that's what King does, and it does illustrate the point, since Lots of people haven't read Dracula. Um, they've probably seen a movie or two, but a movie or two changed certain things.